Okay? Good evening. My name is Rita Liberti. I'm a professor in the Department of Kinesiology, and I direct the Center for Sport and Social Justice. On behalf of the Center's governing and advisory boards, I want to welcome you to tonight's very special event, Dave Zirin in conversation with John Carlos and Wyoming Atias. I know, just, just saying those names and knowing they're in the house is really something. Tonight's program required the coordination of many different units and departments here on campus. I'm hard pressed to think of a part of our university that wasn't involved in some way. Though there isn't time to acknowledge you all individually from the stage this evening, please know that the center is grateful for your efforts, both big and small, to make this event a successful one. Several units on campus did lend uh, direct financial support to this program, and thus the center uh, wishes to thank them publicly. The academic departments of communication, history, kinesiology, sociology, the university library. Other units that offered support for tonight, the Diversity and Inclusion Student Center, the College of Education and Allied Studies, Pioneer Athletics, Alumni Relations, the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, Associated Students Incorporated, Student Life and Leadership, and last but certainly not least, University Extension. Your generous support made tonight possible, and for that you have the Center's thanks. Since the Center's inception at the end of 2011, we have sponsored and hosted over a dozen events, including workshops, lectures, and discussions attended by over 2,000 people on campus and in the East Bay community served by the university. A review of our webpage illustrates the broad range of topics we've broached over the years, our aim to bring critical attention to sports place in our culture by encouraging dialogue and discussion is core to what we do. We want very much to keep our programs and activities such as the one tonight free and open to all. To do that, we need your help. Please consider a donation to the center, invest in us so we can continue to provide spaces and opportunities for those within and beyond the bounds of the university to reimagine sport in our communities. You can find us through the university webpage or we'll take cash, checks, or credit cards, uh, donations in the lobby tonight actually after the program. Four years ago, almost to the day, Dave Zirin spoke, or for those of you that were here, he, uh, you may remember, it was more like a performance than it was a speech. On this stage is the center's inaugural speaker. He has been a good friend to us ever since. In fact, he was instrumental in putting tonight's program together. His powerful and articulate voice has raised public discourse about sport and its place in our world, he has a keen ability to unpack any number of complex issues about politics and sport, then frame them in ways that compel listeners to rethink long-held assumptions about power and resistance, assumptions and perspectives we may not have even known we had. I can't possibly do justice to Dave's resume without keeping you here all night, but let me provide just a couple of highlights. In 2009, Audrey Reader named Zyron one of the, quote, 50 visionaries who are changing the world, end quote. Dave is author of several books, including a collaboration with John Carlos, The John Carlos Story, The Sports Moment That Changed the World. That book and Dave's latest, Brazil's Dance with the Devil, The World Cup, The Olympics, and the Fight for Democracy, are titles on sale in the lobby tonight after tonight's discussion. And also, there will be doing a book signing uh, for those of you that are interested in purchasing those books. More than simply prolific, Dave's writing has earned praise and many awards, including most recently the 2015 New York Press Club Award for Sports Journalism. If you read any of his books, watched his documentaries produced with the Media Education Foundation, listened to his Edge of Sports weekly podcasts, as well as his radio spots on National Public Radio, read his columns as sports editor of The Nation magazine, or seen him on ESPN, MSNBC, and CNN, among many other TV appearances, you have a sense as to the reason Howard Zinn, the late historian and social activist, said of Zirin, if there were an award for most valuable sports writer, I would vote for Dave Zirin. 
Tonight, Dave jo Zyron uh, joins, um, joins John Carlos and Wyomi Atias, again, saying those names just gets me, whose superior athleticism on the track and bold and selfless actions off it stirred the nation and the world. We were thrilled when all three accepted our invitation to come to campus, and we are honored to have them here tonight. They have been generous with their time today, spending the day on campus, speaking to a group of undergraduate students this afternoon, Dave to a journalism class, Ms. Tyus and Dr. Carlos to a sport history class, attending a reception and fundraiser earlier this evening, and now joining Dave Zirin for a conversation and Q&A with you. I've asked Dave to introduce John Carlos and Wyoming Tyus. Please join me in welcoming Dave Zirin. Thank you. Please, uh, give it up again for Rita Liberti who made this happen. Um, I, I was gonna say that Rita Liberti is the Steph Curry of professors, but instead I'm gonna go with Steph Curry is the Rita Liberti of basketball players. I'll go with that. And, um, or, or maybe the Draymond Green, because she is just a Swiss army knife of skills <laughs> in heading this. So I get to introduce our guests, and then we're going to speak on stage till about 8 o'clock, and then we're going to open up the, for the floor for questions, in case you have any questions for these remarkable people. So I'm going to keep my remarks brief, just so everybody, just in case there's even one person here, even one, who doesn't realize what you walked into tonight, you got to know before we start. And it starts by understanding 1968. I mean, this was a year where horror and hope broke out across the globe in a way that we're still feeling to this day. And I could just run through everything that are just these historical touchstones from 1968. The Tet Offensive, the Prague Spring, the mass strikes in France in May, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the slaughter of hundreds of Mexican workers and students before the Olympics in October in Mexico City in what's known as the massacre of Tlatelolco Square. I mean, it was a year of absolutely unholy conflict. And if there is one image that has echoed through the ages, it was of two men raising their black glove fists to the ceiling. And we have a person here who is a part of that image. We have a person here who can testify to the fact that it wasn't just a moment, it was a movement called the Olympic Project for Human Rights. This is a, one of the most remarkable people I've had the privilege to know. He is one of the great track athletes of his time. The guy once ran 100 yards in nine seconds, which if you think about it, is like, I mean, I don't know if I could drive a car 100 yards in nine seconds. And he led San Jose State, AKA Speed City, to the 1969 NCAA championships. And he has never stopped fighting for social and economic justice. It is my honor to introduce to you Dr. John Carlos. Real subtle, John. <laughs> so, and now and this one is special. And before I say one word about this person, please know that she does not do this often. And the fact that she is here tonight is a huge deal. Huge. Bernie Sanders, huge. Not Donald Trump, huge. Okay. <laughs> it is a huge deal. All right. We have a person who is the first human being to win the 100-meter gold in consecutive Olympics in 1964 and 1968. She was part of the legendary crew of women who ran at Tennessee State, known as the Tiger Bells. She is a founding member of the Women's Sports Foundation. She's a member of the National Track and Field Hall of Fame and the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame. And she stood in solidarity, publicly, with John Carlos and Tommy Smith in Mexico City in 1968. And as I said, she does not do this. And so the fact that she's here, this is the first time they've ever spoken on stage together. And this is one of the very few times that she's spoken publicly about her remarkable, remarkable life. Please give a Cal State East Bay welcome to the legendary 
why owe me a Tyus? See, John, that's how you walk out on a stage. You know, you keep your... <laughs> hey, listen, man, I can't change my stripes. <laughs> <laughs> true enough, true enough. So just to very start, I, I really want people here to get to know you both beyond the athletic accomplishments. So, Ms. Tyus, I, I really do uh, want to start with you, and I'm going to ask you both the same question. Give everybody a sense of where you grew up and the first time that you realized you had ability athletically, that was beyond just the schoolyard. Okay, I grew up in uh, Griffin, Georgia, which is about 40 miles south of Atlanta. I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, we did not own the farm. <laughs> My father would work the farm, so it's a different form of um, sharecropping, so he took care of the animals and we went to school. Um, I grew up with three older brothers, so my athletic ability started very young, trying to keep up with them and, and run away from the fights and all those different kinds of things. <laughs> uh, we, I was I always enjoyed sports, and because I was at the time, I grew up in doing the Jim Crow area and all that, and when it was not fashionable and girls should not be competing in sports, and because it's gonna build muscles and nobody, a man would never want them if they had muscles. Mm. But anyway. <laughs> but uh, I had a family of my dad especially was one that said, you know, we tell my brothers all the time, let her play, let her play, cause she's better than you guys anyway. And, and I was, he was right. <laughs> But, uh, it, but I had to be better in order to be a part of the team. And I learned very early to know what it is. If you are, I get beat today, it's always another day. I had to work harder and harder and harder. So my brothers kind of taught me that. And I have to give a big shout out to them that because of them, this is who I am today. I, I never did give up. I never let anything get in my way. I always said, I, if I fall down, I get up and dust myself off and continue. And they had a big part in that because I beat them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, at the age of 15, 14 or 15, I can't remember exactly, but I saw uh, Coach Temple, who's uh, the coach at Tennessee State, not now, but then, he saw me compete in a track meet, and he came up to me and talked to me and said, hey, I think you have some talent here. You know, I would like for you to come and work out at a track camp he had during the summers. And I think that's when I kind of realized, okay, I can do this. But that first summer there, I did not, it didn't go that well. Because I was a lot of great people there that was a lot better than I was. And uh, I can remember after about a week or so of hard practice, going to three practices a day, five in the morning, nine in the morning, and one in the afternoon, that, oh, I cannot do this. This is a little bit too much. And I call home for my mom because my father had passed away, and said to her, hey, I can't do this, I need to come home. She said, well, no, you decided you wanted to go, you have to finish it out, you don't have to go next year. And I thought the best thing that could have happened to me, because that's when my career started. But everybody was beating me. <laughs> I was so used to practicing maybe once or twice a week and winning, and I go there and I'm practicing three times a day and losing. <laughs> Tennessee State, I found out that, hey, women can do a lot more than being a teacher or 
nurse. And that was, that really helped me to go on to be, is decide that I want to go and I want to run and I want to be in the Olympics and I want to do all those things. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Carlos, same question for you. Uh, talk about where you grew up and when you realized that you had more than neighborhood ability, but world-class ability. Well, I grew up in concrete jungle. I grew up in uh, Holland, New York. Uh, I guess you could say I was a thug through, through the sense of Robin Hood. Uh, I had athletic ability as a boxer because I could deal with anybody in the neighborhood. Uh, but my first passion for athletics was swimming. I was a very good swimmer. I wanted to uh, first swim the English Channel. Uh, then I heard about the Olympics on TV and I asked my father, I said, Pop, they ever had a black swimmer represent America? He said, no. I said, I'm gonna be the first. Why did I say I wouldn't be the first? Because I was the best bathtub swimmer in Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. And uh, then I heard on the radio, they started talking about the Olympic Games. Hey, Pop, what's the Olympic Games? He said, well, that's where they bring the greatest athletes together from around the world, uh, physically and mentally, to see who's the strongest nation. I said, well, they ever had a black swimmer represent America? He said, no. Yeah, I'm going to be the first, Pop. And then one day, my father told me, he said, Johnny, you, you're not going to make it as a swimmer. And he educated me about the race car. Just merely because of the color of my skin, I couldn't fulfill the dream uh, that I wanted to uh, partake in, partake. And uh, he said, are you gonna quit? I said, no, I'll find another way. So when I got involved in track and field, I got backed in because as I stated, I was the Robin Hood of New York. Uh, it was a lot of drugs that was dropped on the community. It was a lot of parents that fathers left the household based on the drugs, and here we are 60 years later and a lot of them still haven't returned. So many individuals was not as fortunate as, as me and my, my brothers and sister, for the mere fact that we had a mother and father. Uh, go to my friend's house, a lot of them didn't have food in the ice box, they didn't have clothes in the closet, and I remember Robin Hood used to check out everybody coming through Nottingham Forest, so when the trains came through the Yankee Stadium area, that was my Nottingham Forest. <laughs> he would make them pay a tariff, I would make them pay a tariff in Harlem. Well, as my activity began to take place, it was two detectives, Mr. Lester and Mr. Bryant. Mr. Lester was about maybe six feet, five, ten, somewhere around there, and Mr. Bryant was like six, eight. And they knew my father very well, and they said, my father, Earl, uh, there's been some break-ins at the freight yards, and we think Johnny, and you need to tell him. My father stopped him. Whoa, that's your job. You need to tell him. And when they built the new Yankee Stadium, that's where the track was, at McCoon's Park. And I was over there with a few partners of mine, and they came with the police cars and circled the whole park, make sure we couldn't get out. And they caught up with me, and they, they walked me into the inside of the track and stood there. And Mr. Bryant, the big guy, he says, uh, Mr. Lester, I have something to tell you. And I said, yeah, what's that? He says, there's been some break-ins. We have a good idea of who's doing it. We can't do anything until we catch him. And then he leaned his nose dead up against my nose and pushed me and said, and we gonna catch him. <laughs> In the meantime, you better slow your roll. And Mr. Bryant said, tell me the other thing, tell me the other thing. And I said, uh, yes. He said, well, you have a talent. And I looked at him, well, what, what talent do I have? He said, you're a runner. And when he said that, I smirked. <laughs> and Mr. Bryan smacked me <laughs> on this side of my face, and his fingers landed over here. <laughs> I see stars right now Think about it. He said, don't you ever disrespect Mr. Lester. I said, I'm not disrespecting Mr. Lester. Everyone in my neighborhood could run. And specifically, I was thinking about my mom because my mom was a nurse and she had taken a job working at Bellevue Hospital at night. She was leaving between 10, 30, and 11 o'clock. She went out this particular night and she came back about maybe 30 minutes later with her legs all scarred up, bleeding, and her stockings all torn up. And my father was upset, me and my brothers was upset, and we asked her, what happened? Someone snatched her purse and drug her. So we, quite naturally, was upset. 
And my mother said, oh, I'm okay. Just put some mercurial comb on. I'll be all right. And my father said, no, nah, we're going to find him. And my mother said, that's not necessary. And then she held up her purse. I got my purse back. <laughs> so I, my father said, he said, well, father, how you get your purse back? She said, he started running. I ran him down. <laughs> so I'm telling Mr. Bryant, Mr. Lester, that everybody can run. He said, no, you're special. And from that point on, they gave me a number to the New York Pioneer Club. I got involved in running track. I didn't even like track. But you know, when you get involved in something, you got to find out what your niche is. You know, why, why am I in the track? What do I want out of track? And as I began to run and realized that, as Ty said, she didn't like training. I didn't like training. I was running more on my natural ability. I began to realize that I can run, but I can't go the distance until I create a foundation. So I started to train. And when I started to train, I realized I started to beating people. Now, when you beat people, you still say, well, I have this talent. What can I do with it? And then I began to realize that I need a means for me to go train. And then I realized that the things that my father told me about race relations and so forth, only way I could really deal with that situation is to perfect my game of track and field, become the best that I can possibly be. Because when you become a superstar, people have a tendency to listen to what you say. So I use my athleticism as a springboard to deal with social issues. Mm -hmm. And that's my action mm -hmm. in track. Now, you were both part of legendary track programs, arguably the two most legendary track programs in the history of the United States. Uh, they have resonance for people on, on athletic grounds and on political grounds. And I was hoping each of you could maybe educate the audience about what that track program was all about, who came out of it, and what they accomplished. And I want to start, start with you, Ms. Tyus. I mean, you mentioned it, but the Tennessee State uh, Tiger Bells, I mean, this was such an exquisitely special group of female athletes. Can you speak a little bit about who they were, what they accomplished, and what made them so special? They were all good, but no, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, what made them special, I think, was Coach Temple. Uh, Coach Temple had, you think about it, we were talking about the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, when women's, especially the 50s and the 60s, women's sport was not as it is today. We were not uh, asked to go to do all these things. Coach Temple had a goal, he had a feel for what women, what athletes could do. And he started this program at Tennessee State. And like I said, I used to go there when I was 14 or 15. And once I graduated from um, high school, I went there for, as, for college. But we would go there in the summer, and you would think parents would let their young daughters go to a college campus and with a coach, a male coach, and they felt fine about it. That's because he went to every young girl's home talked to their parents and, and gave them his rules. My rules are these. If they don't follow my rules, I will send them home. And they will go home, come home on that train and I will give them a comic book and an apple so they will have something to read and something to eat on their way home. So he always wanted to, us to be that way. And he was very strict in everything. And I think that's why we had so many hard practices. Because once you came off the track uh, every day, at the, you know, we come off at three o'clock in the afternoon. All you could do is get to the room, take a shower, and lay down, and go to have <laughs> have dinner and come back and lay down because you know you had to be at practice at five o'clock in the morning. So uh, that was his way of training us, and that was his way of keeping us so much, so to speak. You're on a college campus, so you're not getting involved with anything, any of the college ath uh, not athletes, but people on campus. So we trained a lot. It was a little bit hard for me and for everybody. There were some of us that didn't make it. But my goal was I could get this education and I could maybe go to the Olympic Games. So that's what, you know, and that's what I trained for. And also, he, his main rule was that you had to get an education. You had to have come in with a 2.5 or better. He wanted you to have much better than a two foot five going into coming into college, and you had to maintain that because he felt that there were going to be times you may have you're going to travel a lot in one of your semesters, or, uh, and you may not be able to keep up with your grades. You may fall down in one of them or whatever. So you must have a bumper. 
So he always made sure our grades were always up to the hilt, and we always had to work very hard to do that. He, um, the Tiger Bells was like, you know, he, it was a family. That's all I can say, it was a big family. And he would, you know, he had his young ones, he, he had his older ones, and his older girls were supposed to teach the younger girls, teach them about etiquette, teach them about life and being on a college campus and how it is to be a Tiger Bell, what it is to be a Tiger Bell. And there's always, there's a song we used to sing all the time that it's so hard to be a Tiger Bell. <laughs> <Not to laughs> it, it was not just on the track, but also off the track. It was so hard. And most of Temple's thing was, you always have to be a lady's first. You have to do that. And people go, a lady's first? You don't have to do that. I said, in this day and time. At the time, we were competing, yes. People looked at you a lot differently. They would say, oh, well, you look, you know, before we would go to an interview or anything, he would say, well, you have to get yourself together. And that meant that you had to go to the bathroom, comb your hair, look, make, look, make yourself look presentable. That's what he said, because he didn't want you out there having an interview and your hair all over the place, and people go, well, they should have won. They scared everybody. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so these were those are little things as far as being a Tiger Bell. But here's a man that has put 40 women on the Olympic team, and in these 40 women that he's put on the Olympic team, all 40 of these women have graduated with a degree from Tennessee State. It's, they've had. <laughs> thank you. And in putting these 40 women on this team, he has won 23 medals, 13 of them gold. Right. So, you. And, and, and ju just so people know, how big was Tennessee State? Very small. I think when I was in school, we may have had 2,000 or maybe 2,500. Think about that for a second. <laughs> Yes, so it was very small school when I first started. Of course, it grew and it has grown since then. But you're talking about a very small school, and you think about it. If you think about all the colleges and universities throughout the world, I'm not just talking about the U.S. You cannot find anybody that has done anything like that. Coach Temple, to me and to many others, I mean, he has never got his due. He's never got his honors because it's just. There's no way you're thinking about, he put this, you had a Wilma Rudolph with three gold medals, you know, and then after that, it was myself, Edith McGuire Duvall, who's in the audience somewhere. <laughs> what, where is she? Yeah, where's Edith, where's Edith? Where is she? Can you stand up, can you stand up? <laughs> hey, there she is. All right. Oh. Uh, Edith and I, Edith went to Tennessee State that one summer, a uh, summer before me, but we met when I was, we were 15 or so, and we have been best friends ever since, and we talk to each other every day. <laughs> um, uh, and for those of you who don't, Edith won, got second to me in the 100, sorry Edith, but. <laughs> <laughs> She got second to me in the 100, and uh, a quick story, Please. kind of off the story, but they had dubbed Edie to win three gold medals, as Wilma had done in 1960, and, and that came along to kind of mess that up. But uh, <laughs> we, were, uh, we won 100, I came first and she came second, and Mr. Temple was so thrilled. He said, I was just through with the Olympics. I got two people, they won 100. They got first and second in 100. So, uh, Coach Temple would all, he came up and talked to Edith, I remember for before the 200, and he was talking to her, and he, I think Edie told him, Mr. Temple, I'm going to win the 100, I mean the 200. Something is very out of character for her, but she did, and she went on to win the 200, and uh, he was too elated by that. And then we, our relay team took second, which we should have get, we should have a gold medal, but they're not giving it to us. I'm gonna get Dave on it. <laughs> <laughs> To-do to list, here we go. <laughs> yes, to-do list. But uh, this man has done so many great things and mm. as far as uh, track and field is concerned and as far as women are concerned and to take a group of black women and accomplish all the things he has accomplished and to have all 40 of his Olympians finish college with a degree 
It's amazing. And we're not even, there are also athletes that were, did not go to the Olympics that have graduated. I can't give you the stats on that because that's too long. But uh, mm -hmm. that did not go but still got a degree from Tennessee State. And he has always been, for some of us, a father figure, for others, uh, just a coach, but a great coach. And I just think if you could just see some footage or even have, he's never gonna be on a stage again. <laughs> you know, he doesn't speak in the audience anymore. But if you could get to meet him, you could see what a great man he is and what great people he has put out in the world, great women that are doing a lot of things that never get talked about. Mm. Yeah. Mm. He's still with us at 89 years young, right? Yes, and That's still amazing. very good, but very quick to mind, a little bit quicker than me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's one program that can even be talked about in the same breath as Tennessee State, of course, it's Speed City, San Jose State. Uh, we, uh, if, it's, if, I, if I agree with you on that, I would be telling a fib. <laughs> Let me just start by saying, you know, why I'm even negated to tell you that with the greatness of Tennessee State, they won more medals than most countries did in the Olympic Games. That little small school that she's talking about won more medals than most countries that participated in the Games. So that just gives you an idea of really how great this individual was before Title IX, before the money started flowing. Tremendous feat. Now let's talk about San Jose State. You know, we got the San Jose State there. Here was individuals prior to us, like the great Bobby Pointer that's in the audience tonight with his wife. Could you stand up, Bobby? People can see you. And then when I came on the scene, I, I came down to San Jose. I was left New York and came out to California with uh, Bob Beeman. And one we remember Bob from the 29 foot long jump. Then we had Benson Matthews that was on the 68 team in the 1600 meter relay and came back in 72 and won the gold medal in the 400 meters. Then we had another young kid named McCullough, high jumper, seven feet high school high jumper. And then we come out to San Jose to visit a guy from Southern University by the name of George Anderson. And we came out to the track and we see this string beam. When I say string bean, this guy was like the, the, the guy that would draw the picture, the circle, and the two lines for the <laughs> arms and the legs. It was a string bean. And he's on the track with his coach, and we see a guy, he's setting up his camera, his camcorder, and so forth. So we went over to the track, and we said to the coach, say, say coach, he didn't know who we were. Said, uh, is it possible that uh, we can run some of these turns with your guys? Well, this guy was one of the greatest sprinters in the history of sprints. I didn't know it. My compadre was with me, he didn't know it. So, he said, oh sure, come on, because he figured we gonna make this guy look good, he's gonna whip us up. Well, we run the turn, maybe 60 meters on the turn, and we steady spanking him, pop, pop. His coach said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> in the meantime, while we were doing this, it was another fella sitting in the stands. And he comes over excited, I mean, this guy was excited. He struts over there, who are you guys, who are you guys? And more particularly, he wanted to know, who am I? So I tell him, where are you from? I say, uh, I'm from New York. He said, New York. He said, man, you're the missing link. You're the missing link. And I'm looking at him like, is this guy crazy? What do you mean I'm the missing link? <laughs> he said, we need you here in San Jose. I was going to school at East Texas State University. So I said to him, I said, all right, man, well, I'll tell you what, man, we're here for the Nationals. We just wanted to come around. And not until after I talked to this man did I realize that that was the great Tommy Smith that we were running against on the turn. <laughs> so then we went on and we went to the Nationals and then Bob won a medal, I won a medal, Vincent Matthews won a medal, we went back to New York. And I think I took fourth in the 100 and third in the 200. I haven't been accustomed to getting beat. When I went back to New York, I had my head down in shame and one of my buddies told me, he said, John, he said, man, don't be ashamed of the fact that those guys beat you. He said, man, what you ran, most guys can't run on a bicycle going downhill. <laughs> be excited about what you did. 
So then when I got back to San Jose after I left East Texas State about eight months later, I ran into another guy, probably the guy that was there that made the course of history in which took place in 68. My brother, my friend, my competitor that came on the team. He was out of Berkeley, Berkeley High, the Berkeley Flash, that's what they call it. And uh, this same fellow that had talked to me about I'm the, I'm the missing link, he knew about his history because he went to the same school, I believe, and he went and found this guy. He's the pool hustler. And made him put down the pool game and get back involved in track and field. And his brother is Jerry Williams. Would you stand up, Jerry Williams? And stand up, brother, stand up. All right, Williams, sit down, sit down, sit down, Williams. I just want to say, I just want to say one more thing about Mr. Williams, uh, that he has a unique situation in life. You know, my daughter and his son, they come up together. I'm his God, uh, godfather for his son. He's the godfather for my daughter. We raised our kids very well, very excited about it. But Jerry's son, when the Chicago White Sox couldn't win a baseball game or a World Series for 100 years, he went and received a job as the general manager of the Chicago White Sox and put that team together to win the World Series. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I was looking for Cam Newton to do some good, <laughs> but he did no good. And just so happened that Elway, uh, what's, his, what's his name, not Elway? Not Manning. Manning. Manning, right. <laughs> Manning came in, right on, baby girl. Came in and brought them Broncos in, fired up, and they won the Super Bowl. And lo and behold, this man is probably the only family on planet Earth to have a World Series ring in the family and a Super Bowl ring in the family as well. His son was a part of that team as well. All right. So, so now, now, now you check it. You check his flavor out the way he is, right? And and, and, you, and you check out what you might have read or saw or saw me do. This was the flavor of San Jose. We was called the Wild Bunch in certain circles. They had the title based on Bobby Pointer and Ray Norton and those guys. They call it Speed City. This young fella that came to me talking about I was a missing link. He had a vision like Abe Sapplestein to put this team of Speed City the, the back The founder together. of the Harlem Globetrotters. Yes, the, okay. right. Dave yeah. Saperstein is the founder of the, of the Harlem Globetrotters, and this guy's name was Art Sinberg. He had a vision like Abe. So he put us all together. And I remember when I came to San Jose the first time, and I looked at Tommy Smith, I looked at Lee Evans. Lee Evans is the 400-meter, 1,600-meter gold, gold medal winner. Ronnie Ray Smith out of Los Angeles. Uh, on a one by four by one relay. Uh, we had Kurt Clayton. And incidentally, all of these guys was capable of running 9-3 or better, which would have made most nations, they would have been the number one runner in the country. They talk about how great we were. We were great. But we weren't nowhere near as close to greatness as these guys here, this, this lady and her team. Okay? Bar none. Okay? Yeah, we did our thing and everybody held, you know, San Jose stay high, Speed City, yeah, they did, they the bomb. But in my heart, I know they was the bomb. Mm. Okay, because they had far less to work with than us and they proved to be better than Bob, far better than us. But we were so wild in our annex because everyone was against us just based on the way we carried ourselves. But we was determined. I told the coach when I went there, I said, Coach, I said, I've always been a good runner. I said, but I respect you, I admire you, and I appreciate you, and I owe you for the fact that not that you teach me how to run faster, but you taught me how to run more relaxed. I owe you for that. Oh, and incidentally, coach, I won't run no more in one year for you. Why would you say you would run with for him for one year? I was married. I had a kid. I couldn't make no money running for the school. I had to feed my family. So I told the coach, say, Coach, I'm, I'm gone after this year, but I said, I'm going to do one thing for you because with Bobby and Ray and all the guys they had, 
I was a little disappointed with the great talent that Bud had that he never was able to pull the strings together with those guys to win the NC2A championship. So I told Bud on my way out, that's my gift to you. I guarantee you that I will win the NC2A. I brought it home too. Okay? But all of those guys, hey, 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 hey guys, hey, listen, hey, do me a favor. I got this phobia about applause. Please, don't applaud for me. Because I talked to security before I come up on this stage, and I said, I'm going to give them a warning. And if they applaud after, I want you to escort them out of here. <laughs> okay? So I'm not here for applause. I'm not up here doing a soft shoe dance on Broadway. I'm just trying to convey the meat and make sense to us, right? You, know, you, don't, you don't look for applause when you're trying to share. So relative to all those guys, we had another guy that went to San Jose State by the name of Sam Crullers. He had a brother that was on the team with Wyoming and Tyson in 64, and then came back and repeated with me in 68 by the name of Ed Crothers. But Sam Crothers was a great hurdler. But this guy could have been, could have been the number one decathlon man in the world. He was so gifted naturally. But he's just too, he liked to gamble a lot, so he said, I can't make the practice, man. I got a card game. You know? But he was a part of that 69 team that went to the Nationals. We went down to Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, they didn't anticipate us winning. I remember going in. Uh, as, as Ty stated about you having to have that grade point average. When I went to the indoor Nationals at, uh, for the school, they said, well, uh, John Collins is not eligible. Uh, what are you doing? I said, ain't nothing new but the rent's due, and I'm here to collect. Then we go to the Nationals outdoor at the NC2A in Nashville, Knoxville, Tennessee. Carlos is ineligible. Then they said Carlos with his ba band of clowns. Or when they said band of clowns, well, you know, we was offended then. <laughs> but at the same time, they had headlines. They had calculated UCLA is going to win. Only one can compete with UCLA is University of Kansas. Oh, Tennessee State, they're not Tennessee State, but the University of Tennessee, they have a chance. They didn't even have us on the chart. And I told them, I said to them, I said, look, guys, they're putting us down. I said, and it looked like just based on the way we carry ourselves, they don't want us to be the champion. I said, but we got God on our side, and we train hard. Yes, we have a lot of fun, and we did a lot of political activity. But yet, still, every time, whether we went to Europe to represent the United States or anywhere, we knew what our mission was. Mm -hmm. Our mission was to win. If we stayed up all night and the coach came in, knock on the door, say, hey, you guys making too much noise. You know, y'all got a big competition tomorrow. Y'all need to go to bed. We tell the coach, say, coach, do me a favor. Come on in here and put your money on the table and pick up a game and try and win some money. <laughs> but ain't no little kids in here. We know what our mission is tomorrow. And the coach was zeroing on that, going to his pocket, bring out some money, getting a couple of hands. Mm. All right, guys, I'll see you on the track. <laughs> and the next day, we knew what our job was to go out there and represent America and represent America well. We had a lot of fun doing it. We always brought the bacon home. Regardless of what people might have thought about us, we was always on the job. We never tried to brag about who we were. We let other people brag for us. Speed City. I always had admiration and love for Bobby Pointer, for Ray Norton, just because they was the marquee for me when I went to San Jose State. It wasn't about Jerry. I didn't even know about Jerry Williams. But the fact that Jerry Williams right there and his wife had Jerry not been in San Jose State, it probably wouldn't have been a whole bunch of ruckus about that demonstration in Mexico City because I probably wouldn't have stayed in San Jose. The only love that made me drop anchor in San Jose State was Jerry and Ethel Williams, and I'll leave it alone. Mm. And of course, we, we got to give a shout out to Mr. San Jose State. He's here somewhere, Ron Davis. Oh, yeah, for God, Where's you Ron? are absolutely Just right. Give it up, Ron Davis. Thank you. Awful <laughs> man, thank you. Uh, Ron, I apologize. Man. But Ron's so humble, he's probably madder at me for mentioning him than you not mentioning him, because that's how Ron <laughs> is. So, so you mentioned Mexico City, and this is. Uh, re really, I've been waiting to ask Ms. Tyus this for oh, only about 15 years, so I'm very excited. This so Mexico. 
Mexico City, of course, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, they raise their black love fists to the heavens in the name of human rights and social justice. They're not wearing shoes to protest poverty in the United States. They're wearing beads and scarves around their necks to call to the history of lynching in the United States. They're wearing buttons that say Olympic Project for Human Rights. It is this historic moment. It is this beautiful moment, but it's more than a moment. It's a movement called the Olympic Project for Human Rights that had been organizing for several years before John Carlos came on the scene. Now, in those several years, they did amazing things, but one thing that they did also was that they did not actively try to organize women who were part of track and field. Black women, white women, they, and in particular, you have this incredible crop of runners at Tennessee State who are, are tearing up the world, and there's no effort to reach them and say, be part of our struggle. Now, after John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their fists and the uproar started and they, were, they, they left Mexico City, the lies were told that they were kicked out of the country and all kinds of things. When after all this happened, Wyoming Atiyah, she, she anchors the four by 100 women's gold medal relay team. And then in front of the world, she holds up her medal and she says, I'm dedicating this to John Carlos and Tommy Smith. And it was an incredible act of courage but you also, you stood in solidarity with a demonstration that was also excluding you. So why did you make that choice in Mexico City to say, I stand with John Carlos and Tommy Smith? Well, it was for human rights, and that's what we were talking about. And I was part of the human rights, although I was not included, that lets you know right there, they were not including women in the beginning, and for me to dedicate my medal to them, that lets, the world know, and also everybody, and them too, that I'm still a part of you. I still believe in what's going on, what you believe in, what we need to do, what we need to do, come together, because that's how we do it. You have to do it together. You can't do it separately. We all have to be on pretty, not always the same page, but we have to be focused on where we're going and which way we're going. And also, you have to think about the fact that we were in Tennessee and they were in California. And when you think about that, then there is a big gap there. I mean, I can remember back when uh, the reporters would call Coach Temple and ask him all the time, could we speak to Wyoming? Could we talk to somebody on the, one of the Tiger Bells about, because this has just been said at San Jose State, whether Carlos said it or Tommy said it or what's his, Harry Erwitz said it, and how do they feel about it? Are they gonna do this? Or are they not gonna go to the Olympics? And our rule was, well, we first have to make the team to say we're not gonna go. You know, <laughs> we can sit here and say, oh no, we're not gonna go, we're gonna boycott. up. But if you're not on the team, you can't do it. So it was always, when we make the team, talk to us. And uh, it finally, you know, but even once we made the team, they didn't talk to us either. <laughs> so, but basically, it, was, it goes back to human rights. And um, we all have them. And, Women, black women, women, all colors were not getting what they deserved. We, you know, we couldn't do certain things. You couldn't be, participate in sports. They were not in, in the colleges. They didn't have this. They didn't offer these things. So it was all about that. It was, again, most people think of it, it was just all about black power. In my mind, and, and all the people now that they have heard a lot about what went on in 68, they know now that it was about human rights and not just human rights on the athletic field, human rights all over, whether you could go in, you know, in Mexico City, when we were there, it was a student uprising. They were doing all those things. It was all about that. It was what was going on in all the countries of the world and how we can unite and make it a better place for all of us to live, not just one group of people, but for all people. Mm. You heard that. Hey. You heard it. And, and, and John, if you could also give your, your own reflection about 1968, the moment on the medal stand, and your thoughts about the, the women athletes, and you've spoken to me about this, about how you felt the need for them to be included, not excluded in what was happening. Well, you know, when you sit back and think about 68, you have to think about what was taking place in the United States at that particular time. Uh, we were on fire as a nation. 
when you sit back and you think about, you know, Dr. King was assassinated that year, Robert Kennedy was assassinated that year, they had the Civil War unrest in Chicago that year, uh, it was riots coast to coast in, in the United States at that particular year. So we had a tremendous amount of things taking place. Then when we went to Mexico City, uh, it was an enormous amount of Mexican students and, and the supporters of those students that lost their lives that most people here in the United States don't even know 48 years later. They don't know, they, they're talking about 150 people died, first it was 50 people, now it's like 350 people, but in actuality it was 2,000 plus people that lost their lives. They put them in the furnace, burned their bodies when they couldn't put them on the furnace, they took the rest out, dumped them in the ocean. Then they told, turn the guns on the people that was left and told them to go up into the mountains and don't come down until the game start. And yet and still, when all the people got off the plane to go to Mexico City, they had the slums right in back of, of the airport. So opposed to them trying to clean up the slums and taking them people from eating out the gutter, feeding their kids out the gutter, instead they decided to put posters up of the Olympic Games to cover up the slums opposed to trying to clean up the slums. Wow. So when you Sounds saw, like the Super Bowl hosting yeah. here in the a Bay Area. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I see how they moved those people off, out from the waterfront and put them out there under the bridge. Mm -hmm. So it's the, sa it's the same yeah. game. Uh, so when you sit back and you look at these things, it's a matter of saying to yourself, one more time for me, what can I do to make a positive statement that will ring around the world? So you know, like I thought this unification in terms of us collectively coming together for an Olympic boycott might be the way to go. Because I thought to myself, wow, if we step back from the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War as black people, I wonder if America would have been that great in those wars. So then I said, if we step back from the Olympic Games, I wonder if we'll be missing the games and maybe they'll look at us from another perspective next time. But then when we try and educate the athletes as to why we felt it was necessary to boycott, a lot of the athletes felt like that was a hard thing to swallow. Something that I had been trained from the time I was that high off this ground where they hold a carrot in front of you and always teach you from the time you're a little kid, go for the gold, be Olympic champion. So everyone had that dream. I had that dream. Wyoming had that dream. Everybody has the dream to go to the Olympics. So we said, let's educate them. Let's try and sit them down and make them why it's necessary to boycott the Olympic Games. And when it all came down, individuals started saying, man, you know, I trained all my life to go and win a medal. I promised my church I was going to bring the medal home. My kids, my wife, uh, they're counting on me to bring that medal home. When they start giving stories like that, we didn't have no right to tell those individuals that, hey, man, you have to boycott the games. So we took a vote in Denver, Colorado. And we just said, are we going to boycott the games or are we going to go to the games? What's the vote? Well, the vote came that they wanted to go to the games. I thought right away, well, they can go, I'm not going. But God is a heavy dude, because God touched my brain and told me, he said, you know, Johnny, if you stay home, what you accomplishing by staying home? Because America is the greatest nation on the earth at that particular time in track and field. You stay home, somebody gonna go and win that medal and get in your place. The question is, when they get on the victory stand, well, they represent you the way you feel you should be represented then it was imperative that I go. And to be sure that I went because they, they played political games, because I should have been the gold medal winner in 100 meters, my belief, but they chinook me because of my political views. They wouldn't even let me run the 100 meters in the trials. But I can live with that, because it ain't about me winning for me, it's me winning for them. If they choose they don't want me to run and win for them, so be it, no problem. But as time went on, I said, I have to go to the games, and I started preparing myself. And when I did, I broke all the world records to go. Then they came back and told me, well, you're not going to get credit for the world record because obviously the shoes I had on had motors in them, or either they had a dog chasing a cat and a cat chasing the mouse to give me more traction. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but they didn't give me the world records that I set. But it wasn't about world records. I needed to approach the victory stand to make a statement that will revolutionize the minds of many people on the planet. And I think in time, it's starting to turn the corner. A lot of people was fear, had a fear factor because the press said it was a militant act 
And when you heard about militancy back in the 60s, you think, and particularly white folks think, oh, they're trying to overthrow the government. Oh, they're trying to destroy the Statue of Liberty. Oh, they're trying to poison our water, which was so far from the truth. But remember when the right-wing press says something, they put a twist on it to intimidate you. Mm. And word, you sit back and think about from 1968 to present day, most people in the United States think they took John Collins' medal away, or they took Tommy Smith's medal away. Lies, propaganda, falsities. They came and told the world that they took our medals away. They came to me right after the demonstration. Stop, Mr. Smith and I at the Hotel Diplomatic, where all the Olympic officials were staying, they was upset because we were staying in the same hotel. <laughs> we come downstairs in the lobby and elevate our ham saying in Spanish, they're going to take our medals away and they're going to run us out the country. Well, I was glad because I had my visa in my back pocket. <laughs> when I got downstairs, all the pressure swooped on us. One of them said, oh, I understand that they say that they're going to take your medal and run you out the country. I looked at Tommy, Tommy looked at me. I said, let me speak to you. I said, I don't know about Mr. Smith, but let me tell you about John Collins. I said, the medal has no significant value to me. I said, but let me tell you this. You didn't come to my house and knock on my door and tell me, say, hey, John, we got an open slot, man. We want to put you on the team. They told me it was an Olympic trials, and I had to meet a standard to make the trials. Then when I got to the trials, it wasn't no gift. I had to go through the process of elimination to get there on the team. I made the team. I went through the process, went to Mexico City. They didn't say one more time, John, it's the opening. Step up there and receive this medal. I had to go one more time through the process of elimination through the world to get there. So I told him, I said, if you feel that you want this medal and it doesn't really mean anything to me, bring the militia because you're going to need them to get this one back. <laughs> Why? Because as I state, the medal don't mean anything to me, but it might mean everything to my kids. That's their medal. So then they backed away, but they lied for 48 years and told all young athletes from that point on. You ever seen a horse and buggy for you older guys that's in there? <laughs> You ever seen that horse and buggy you used to pull a, pull a produce stand or, or pull a little ice cart? And you, you people focus on the produce stand and, and, and the ice cart. I didn't focus on them. I used to focus on the horse. And when I looked at that horse, what did I notice about the horse? They had put some blinders on his side. So the horse couldn't look to the left and say, oh, it looks good over there. Let me go that way. Or let me go to the right. Well, that's what they did with young athletes by telling them that they took our medals away. In other words, don't think outside the box, because if you do what we did to Tommy Smith and John Collins, we're going to do to you. Mm. But I didn't go for the carrot when I was a little boy to think that it was all about the medals. It's about life. It's about having the freedom to be who you are. It's about saying, let me enjoy my life. Let me enjoy this ride that I'm on. I can never go to a track meet any time I ran track and be so rigid that I'm so rigid, focused on track and field, that I couldn't be me. I'm always be me. Mm. So they got used to me after a while. They didn't want me in the Hall of Fame. Guys went in the Hall of Fame 30 years before me. They couldn't carry my shoes. But I ain't never raised no cane about that because their Hall of Fame, that's they lost when they keep me out. So eventually I come in, San Jose State, Chuck, just recently. Other guys went in San Jose City Hall. They went in their Hall of Fame 30 years ago. Tommy Smith, uh, Lee Evans. Why didn't John Collins go in there? Because I'm not having no fear about speaking my mind about the issues that we deal with in society. As I told the students in the class today, I'm going to tell each and every one of y'all in this audience right now. I was at a crossroads in my life when I went to Mexico City. Every one of you are going to be at the crossroads of your life before you leave here as well. The question is, whether you have the gumption in you, the stamina in you, the will to do the right thing. Regardless of how many people tell you, man, you're going the wrong way, you should be swimming downhill, not uphill. You can't pay attention to that because the life that you live in is not for you. You just happen to be here filling the gap. But when you think about it, 
A lot of people sit back and say, oh, Johnny was born June 5th, 1945. That's the day to celebrate. And then the other day, oh, Johnny died such and such a day. Oh, that's the day to be sorry. Well, the day I was born is not relevant. The day I die is not relevant. But what's relevant is what I did between those two days. And that stands the same thing in your life. What are you doing with your life? So I got to about <laughs> half my questions. Um, and I do want there to be time for folks to ask questions. But I would be so remiss if I didn't ask one last question for you both to answer. And the question is this. And I'll start with you, Ms. Tyus. Back in 1968, when you were doing your thing, both in terms of your athletic ability and your political voice, did you ever imagine that 48 years later, we'd be discussing your life at an event sponsored by an academic center that takes inspiration from your actions? No, that was never, <laughs> never, never, ever. I, you know, you, when you're going through things and you're doing this, you're not thinking about what's going to happen, how it's going to play out. You're thinking about this is what's happening now. This is where my voice needs to be heard. This is where I need to be saying and doing the things that's going to make what I feel in me the right thing to do. And uh, hopefully in doing the right thing, it will also inspire other people, not just women, but other people, all people to do what they feel in their heart and they know in their heart that could help everybody, and not just my little world, not my little community, but the world in itself. And it's so, I never would have thought about anything like this and I'm just very pleased and honored to even be here tonight to be able to share a part of my story and a part of the Tiger Bell story. There's so much more to be shared and hopefully, along with Dave and I, we are going to get that shared that people can not only know what I have done, but what other women have done that were Tiger Bells and maybe even women that are not Tiger Bells that have really contributed to this world of ours. Mm. You see, this is why I got a message on Twitter about an hour ago from Kerry Washington saying, please tell Wyoming Atias I love you and thank you. So th that's why. And, um, and same question to you, John. And it better just not be yes. But well, I, was you imagine this, I was just getting ready to say diddle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> diddle. I mean, because uh, she hit it on the head. You know, you, you don't go to, to make a statement. You just do what you're supposed to do. And if you do it and do it right, it's there. And people are going to pick it up. If they don't pick it up that day, it's done. It's documented. They will pick it up another day. 48 years, people are still picking it up every day. Kids look at that image. They wasn't even born. 40 years ago, they wasn't even thought of. They wasn't thought to their mother and father because they was kids. But then when you sit back and see a kid see this picture in his textbook in school and he turn the page, the first thing he do if he pass the page, he got to turn it back. Why is he turning it back? Because this is extraordinary. This is unusual. I've never seen anything like this. And my students used to come to me at school and say, uh, Mr. Carlos, I, you know, I saw this, this picture in my textbook and I'm checking it out and I see your name down there. <laughs> and the other guy talking about, Man, that ain't Mr. Carl's. Mr. Carl's an old man. That, 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 that's not him. <laughs> and I look at the kids and I tell them, I say, I'll tell you what you do. Uh, why don't you go and do some research on it and then come back and we'll discuss it. And then the first thing the kids tell me when we get back, they say, well, Mr. Carl's, why is it that they have this picture here of you and they got two or three lines under the picture, but they had no text in there about what this is about? Mm. So it shows you that the powers to be, they're struck by that motion too. They can't negate it or put it out their mind or erase it or anything. And then you tell me in the audience here, I know that they left this planet as they told me and they went to the moon. I don't see the moon documented like I see that demonstration in Mexico City documented. Why is that? See, so it's, it's about coming out of the box sometimes to make a statement. 
And once the statement is made, they can't take it back. It's just like if I told everybody in this audience, say, I love you, like I come out throwing kisses. And somebody stand up and say, I don't want your love. Well, that's too damn bad, because I done gave it to you. <laughs> now, now, the best thing you can do is take that love and give it to somebody else. Because that's the problem that we have in society in terms of trying to deal with racism and, 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 and bias and prejudice, is the fact that they took love and knocked it up, and locked it up, and put it in prison, and don't want people to acknowledge one another with love and sharing love and having understanding of love. If we had that, then we can get down. I'm not pissed off at the KKK. I say, but I'm disappointed in the KKK because they're so narrow-minded that they can't sit down at the table and have some dialogue about why they feel the way they feel. And until we get to the table and start having dialogue, until we get there, this, you sit back and say, why is the president of the United States, the first black president of this nation, nobody in this audience, black, white, or what have you, could tell me that he's the most disrespected president in the history of the presidency. And I don't think any president on record has had to tackle what he had to tackle. They got haters on the Republican side. They even got haters in the House on the Democratic side. But I've never seen him crack. I never seen him whimper. I never seen him lose his cool. And I always see him drive. And that's the same drive that I had in Mexico City. And God let me know that the stamina that he has, he drew something from me. Uh, thank you. All right. <laughs> Round of applause, please, for Wyoming Atias and Dr. John Carlos. Security, security, where's security? Now, we do have about uh, 15 minutes for questions, and it's worth, it's, it's worth it because this is a university. We want to have that kind of dialogue and back and forth. But hold on one second. One, real quick, what, but before we go to any questions in the audience, I want to really recognize and give a round of applause to the people who've been doing the sign language here. This is really hard work. And you should get up too. Please get up too. Get up too, please. Both people. It's, it's, it, if you've never done it, just trust me. That's why I love David Zarin. He don't miss, a, he don't, boy, he oh, don't stop, miss stop. nothing. Man, I'd, I'd rather do my taxes than sign for 90 minutes. It's really hard. Um, so Where's Ron Davis? Any Get questions question folks up. have? Did Ron Davis leave? Well, shoot the question. Let's go. We run out of time. The question, really, what I wanted to say was, Dave, one of the things, I saw your book outside, the John Carlos story, and I just wanted everyone to know the last book before he passed the Honorable Nelson Mandela was reading the John Carlos story. Yeah, my buddy Nelson. Yeah, we, we, we have the, the, the frame picture. And it's so funny, because even my in-laws are, are to the right of Genghis Khan, and they have a picture of Nelson reading the book <laughs> up in their house. So it, it's a beautiful thing. OK, I, it I, is I, the time. Let's get these questions working. Yes, any hands, I yeah. see. Uh, here. Oh, sure. Who else got the mic? My name is Kenny Bayless. I graduated from Cal State here and I ran track. I first would like to say to Jerry Williams, I'm also an alumni of Berkeley High School. I got to Berkeley High School in 1965 and when I walked out on the track, Jerry Williams' name was on every record on the board. <laughs> and and, I, 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 and I, now I'm getting to finally get the chance to meet you which is just great for me. But two things for, for, for John Carlos. I was at the Fresno Relays when John Carlos ran a nine flat. Matter of fact, I was told later that two timers had him run nine flat and two other timers had him run at, at eight, nine. Yeah, eight, nine. So John, yeah. I would like to reflect on that. And the other question I want to ask, two parts, is in 
I believe it was in Utah, you had tried on some brand new spikes. They were brush spikes. And you ran a world's record, but they did not give you that record. Could you expound on both of those? Tahoe. Well, Tahoe, actually. Tahoe. 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 Uh, let me see. You talking about Fresno? Uh, Fresno no, you talking about Fresno first, Mr. Williams. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what happened in, in Fresno, California, is that I was pumped up to break the world record. I was in shape. Uh, I'd run 9-2 easing up in uh, Modesto, uh, Mount Sac Relay. And Bud Winters said, John, you, what, what's wrong with you? You could have broke the world record. And I told Bud, I said, look, Bud, I appreciate the fact that you want me to break it here. But in my estimation, man, the soul of track and field in California is the Fresno Relays. I said, that's where all the black faces are. I want to bring it in front of them. <laughs> so then when I went to Fresno, I ran. Uh, I remember running my heats. It was a very hot, extremely hot day. And I remember I used to have a big hat on my head. And they used to have an island walking down all the way to the hotels in the middle of the street. And I remember walking down the island, going back to the motel we were staying in, and people stopping and they hunking. You want to lift? You want to lift? I said, nah. But what I was doing, I was getting focused as to what I had to do. And when I got back, I never forget, and I probably shouldn't say this, but we ain't no kids in here, so I can say it. I'm a New York and I've always been my own man, you know, so like I drink a little scotch. <laughs> and, and I remember I told the coach, I said, said coach, uh, I said, man, I need some, some Coca-Cola for my scotch. <laughs> you, you, can, you can, I said, coach, remember now, you the coach, I'm the runner, let me do my thing. <laughs> so he went and got me some Coca-Cola, hooked it up, and I got back and I told him, I said, all right, coach, I'm going to blow the world record up. There's two people going to get credit. I'm going to give you credit, and I'm going to give the trainer credit. Now, Kenny, you was close. They had four watches that had me in 8 plus. They had three watches that had me in 8.8, eight, and one watch had me in 8.9, and then they had one, well, the fifth watch had me in 9.1. Now, a head timer was a guy, he's close to 90 years old. <laughs> That's the one that had me in 9.1. He overruled everybody else, and he told him, he said, no one in the world could run that fast. He, he couldn't run that fast. And when the picture came out, I'm 10 yards in front of the field. But everybody in back of me, they gave 9-3. So I said to him, I said, whoa, look at the picture. If everybody ran 9-3 and everybody there was capable of running 9-3 or better, I said, if you gave them 9-3, how could 10 yards be uh, equivalent to two tenths of a second? They shrugged their shoulders. Okay, that right there made me stop running in terms of giving you as spectators the gift that God gave me to give to you. I stopped running for times. I started running to just win races and make sure that they couldn't steal races from me no more. And it saddened me then and I'm still saddened about it now because I feel like they never really saw the potential that I had. And when I went to Mexico City, well, if I told y'all what I was capable of running, you would get up and leave. But I felt in Mexico City, I was capable of running 19-2, 19-3 easy. See, and a lot of people sit back, man, you're crazy. And I look at him, I say, well, Mr. Smith ran 19-8-3. And he threw his hands up, looked like maybe eight meters before the finish line. If you look at the, the video, if you go back and check the video out, you will see me blow off that turn. I'm like eight to 10 meters in front. But also you will see me pull back at, with 80 meters to go and striding down that table. Only time you see me try and come back to a sprint is when I looked over at Peter Norman because I forgot about Peter Norman. <laughs> no, listen, listen. I forgot about Peter Norman. I wasn't worried about him, but I forgot about him because Peter's race the last 20 meters of the 200 meters was the best part of his race. And when I dawned on me, Peter Norman and I turned, you can see me in the film, turn around and look, and he was there. I couldn't start sprinting again with 10 meters to go. I'm in stride maybe 70 meters already. So I went in and I looked at the clock and God said, man, I got you covered. Because with all I did, I ran 20 flat we're all looking around and striding in the whole nine yards. So it made me realize that I was on point for what I was capable of doing. Uh, 
Track and field has been like a blessing for me and a lot of individuals because we got a chance to see the world. We got a chance to give our love to the world and make a whole bunch of old men and old women happy to sit there and see these things before they left and they had the opportunity to hug and kiss and play with babies too. There's no sport in the world in the world better than track and field. Remember, if you've got a son and he played ping pong, remember he's my birth child because he came through track and field. He had to go out and jog just to get his wits. A boxer, does he not go out and run? A swimmer, you think that guy that won all the medals, what's his name, Mike? Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps, you think Mike didn't go out and run? Mike Anybody, doing, any doing sport, something. soccer players, you think yeah. they're not the birth child of track and field? They just took track and threw a ball down there. Somebody said, oh, what's that? Okay, so that's the mother of track and field. I'm the father of track and field. And when I say she's the mother and I'm the father, based on the fact that we are pillows of the sport. So like when we see drugs being involved in the sports and we might talk about it or we might be silent about it, it runs through our blood with disdain because we feel that these athletes don't need to do drugs to do what we did 50 years ago. Mm. Remember that. They don't need the drugs. And y'all should raise your voices about it. Nobody in here is crazy to look at the times they run and think that they straight times. Take a giraffe and put him in a chute next to a wild boar for 100 meters and let him go. And I ask everyone in here, who would win the race? The deer, I mean the giraffe or the, or the wild boar? And most people look at me and tell me, they're giraffe. Why? Because his legs are longer. Well, how fast can a long-legged man turn his legs over? <coughs> he can't turn them over like the boar. And remember, he's only running 100 yards. He ain't running a mile. So y'all figure it out. I, I, I have no idea who you could be referring to about a long-legged <laughs> sprinter. It, it's a mystery. Um, <laughs> Is, is there a question for Ms. Tyus? I was very specifically for Ms. Tyus. Yeah, up there in the, in the red I, I'm sorry, I, I just can't see from here, but if you have a question for Ms. Tyus, please. Thank you. Ms. Tyus, you're one, you're the first of three women who have, who have repeated as Olympic 100 meter gold medalists. Uh, the other two, of course, as you know, being Gail Devers and Shelly and Fra Frazier Price. And I'm just curious, they've been able to capitalize on this being a professional sport now, you came into track and field as it was becoming professional in the early 70s, right? And I'm just curious, what happened, what, what, how have you been able to capitalize on your two Olympic gold medals, certainly in a way that was different than what they've been able to do now with all of the money that's part of the sport? Mm. Oh. <laughs> well, first of all, it was three gold medals. I, let me say that. <laughs> Straight them out, straight them out. <laughs> and, uh, and it was the 60s that I was competing, and they were definitely not paying women to do anything. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there, I mean, in the 68 Olympics, there was money been found in shoes, right, John? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but only in men's shoes. <laughs> so, uh, to be able to talk about whether I capitalize off it, no, my capitalization of it is basically if I get t speeches and things like that, I've never got an endorsement to endorse a shoe or be in a commercial or anything like that. That has never happened. Doesn't mean it can't happen. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, it's just been hard work having a steady job for the, up until about four years ago when I retired. And that's my capitalization on my education that I got in college. Wow. Hey, can I, can I be real? Can I be real with you? Real as right. you want Brother, you asked why you know, she hasn't gotten anything. I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to be real with everybody in here. The reason why I want me to tie and get anything because of the complexion of her skin. Because she's not a fair-skinned black woman. Right? They were still in the Lena Horn frame of mind. I was, you, know, you sit back and think, and you say, well, how did Lena Horne get her? Because she was black, but she was fair-skinned with her talent. This woman here was a gift from God athletically. But merely because of the color of her skin, she didn't get the endorsements from Adidas. She didn't get the Coca-Cola endorsements. Here later in years, a lot of people were starting to get on TV with a darker shade. 
But Wami Tides didn't get hers merely because of the same thing that we've been talking all along. When you sit back and you talk about why didn't the individuals from Tennessee State get what they were supposed to get as great as they are? I bet if down the road or up the road at the University of Tennessee, if they was raising Cain and had white girls raising Cain the way they were, I guarantee there would have been stories about them for the last 50 years. Okay? I'm just trying to be real. Okay? And, and I'm not saying anything other than the fact that it was wrong. I mean, how do our kids feel? Say, Mommy, you, you, you did everything. Why come they getting so-and-so? How do you explain that to your kids? I remember when Doug Williams won the Super Bowl, and everybody leading up to Doug Williams before him that won the, the Super Bowl, uh, where are you going? I'm going to Disneyland. When Doug Williams won, they didn't go to Doug, let Doug sit in. They went to John Elway. And John Elway didn't win the game. But they went to Elway, where are you going? I'm going to Disneyland. And I said, well, wait a minute, did, did I hear that? Okay, but we accept this thing, but it hurts. Most people don't speak on it. I'm gonna speak on it until I find God to ask him why did he allow these things to happen. And until I find God to talk to him, I'm gonna talk to the people here to make them realize that we gotta squish these differences. Hmm. All right, I'm, I'm sorry good. I had to say that. It's, um, and we, we have time for one last question. Oh, what? Oh, I'm so sorry. So then we got a couple more. I know folks have had their hands up. Over here, over here. We'll, we'll, we'll get. We'll, we'll figure it out. Okay, I'll be really brief. My name is Kiana. I am a student here. Um, Where I'm, you at? Oh, okay. I'm 34, so I'm a returning student actually for my BA. But I came here as a extra credit assignment by Dr. Duke, and I am like I am shivering right now because. As a black woman, this is phenomenal to be in front of you guys. And I just want to say, like, this, this is really a moment for me. Um, I remember talking to my grandmother about stories like this and never would have thought in imagined years that I would be able to be in front of you guys. And I brought my five-year-old, who is very agitated right now because he's ready to go, but this is, <laughs> this is a moment for him. He actually plays baseball and football and basketball, but he will be running track now. But do me, do me, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Hey, wait, wait. do me a favor, do me a favor right now while we're on stage, bring your little five here to the stage and let him here and let somebody take a picture for us oh, right now while we're doing the question there. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also really quick wanted to say that it's just sad that we don't have this history because I literally asked, well told five people what was going on and why I was coming here and nobody knew anything about you guys. Wow. So it's sad, but trust me, I will make sure that they know. Right Great. Right Thank you. So somebody, we'll do a picture. Let me... Somebody got a camera? Yeah, we got it. All we right. got it. There you go, Derek. And I, I want to make sure who, Yeah, let's keep the questions coming. Go. Are you up, man? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Come on up here. My main, my main question to Dr. Carlos is, how much did Peter Norman actually know about the demonstration that was going on? But more importantly... <laughs> We're listening. We're listening. You gotta oh, do no it, worries. man. No worries. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> but more importantly, what is the role of white people in a social justice movement? What is the role of white people? Yes. Oh, let's talk about Peter Norman first. The role of white people is to be like Peter Norman and John Brown. Speak the truth. Simple as that. Okay, that's the role of white people is not be offended by other white people that think that black people shouldn't have the right to live or Indians shouldn't have the right to live or Arabs shouldn't have the right to live or people with gay persuasion shouldn't have the right to live. It's for white people to step up and say, you're wrong, and we need to change it, yeah. okay? Now, relative to Peter Norman specifically, you want to know what did he know about the role of what we was doing? We were there, as I stated, Tommy and I met roughly 30 minutes prior to us going out there to the victory stand to decide that we wanted to do something, make a statement. 
When we got inside the tunnel, by that time, we had had all the artifacts. You know, Tommy say he had gloves, I say bring them. I had beads, he say bring them. He had a black scarf, say bring them. I had a black shirt to cover my USA jersey, bring them. We both had our black socks on, and we decided to go out there barefoot. But when we in the tunnel, getting prepared to go out, Peter's looking, he said, what y'all doing? <laughs> and I said to him, I said, man, let me ask you a question. He said, what's that? I said, do you believe in human rights? And Peter began to tell me about his mom and dad, a Salvation Army worker, since he was a baby. Well, I know what the Salvation Army is all about. They're about humanity. So he said, of course I believe in human rights. I said, would you like to wear an Olympic Project for Human Rights button? He started reaching for mine. I had to, <laughs> can't get this one, but I'll get you one. We had a white fella that was a rower for Harvard University, because the rowers, they were hippies. Maybe even before hippies, they was beatniks. <laughs> but they was down with us, they had long hair, bandanas, the whole nine yards, but they was in full support. And I, on the way out, I asked Paul, I said, Paul, I need a button. And he's pointing down to me, you got a button. I said, I know, but this is for Peter. And when I told him it was for Peter, like he was like lit up like Christmas tree. And you hear him rip his button off and he threw it down to me, and I pinned it on Peter as we going out. And we got there. And see, and here's the trip. A lot of people don't know, Tommy Smith and John Carlos went through hell on earth. Okay, I might not look at it like it because I'm so cool right now. <laughs> okay, but I went through hell, and Mr. Smith did too. But Mr. Norman went through the same hell. But the difference is this. Here in the United States, if they want to give me hell, they'll give me hell until they get tired. They said, because we got this other guy on the other side of town, Tommy Smith, let's go find him and give him help. Then when they get tired, they can come back to me. But Peter Norman was in Australia, where it was a nation that was parallel to the ideology of South Africa, relative to their Aboriginal people. Now, you mean you're going to go stand at the Olympic Games, the greatest spectacle in the world, and you're going to support two blacks? So when he went through hell in Australia, it wasn't no spinoff and said, we got Carlos, and we got Smith, and then we got Peter. They beat Peter 24-7, seven, seven days, up and down. But he never flinched, he never backed up, he never denounced us, he never turned his back on us. And I love Peter until I die, and wherever I go in the stratosphere, I'm going to have more love as I grow. Mm. Okay? I respect, I admire, I love Peter Norman. Mm. And, and we have time for one more question. The gentleman here has been very patient. Two more, two more. Two more, two more. I mean, all right, I'm going by. Two more. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I like, I like this audience, man. I like this audience. No, I know, but I got to get full. All right, forward. <laughs> yes, uh, it's a real honor of meeting um, you, Ms. Tyus, and, uh, and, and Dr. Carlos. Hey, um, you're, uh, you're such a person, a great character. Is that Mantan? Yeah, that's me. All right. <laughs> Hey, um, you told me so many great stories. Uh, I just got here, I got here a little late, but you know that story, brother, that like just stuck with me forever was, you know, that really kind of defined your character was when you were living, I think you said in Harlem or something, and when you was a kid, and it's something about the, the property manager that, that wasn't doing you guys right, and you went and told him you got 24 hours 48, 48, hours. 48 hours. 48 hours. Yeah. So I'd like you to share that with him, bro, because that defines who you are, man. Yeah, I'm right. like, you know what I mean? That's, you started that. <laughs> you started that, man. All right, here you want me to tell this question. I'm going to try to push it real quick. When I was a kid, you know, uh, we, <laughs> I'm still a kid at heart. You, you guys know I'm still a kid at heart, right? Well, anyway, when I rephrase that, when I was younger, we used to play stickball in the project. And all the women be sitting down on the bench, the mothers, they sit on the bench and they talk. And as I stated earlier, my mother used to work nights, so when she would come in from work in the morning, she would come in, she would always be courteous to the ladies and nod to them, but she would never stop and sit down and talk to them. So one day, I said, it's time for me to have a talk to my mother. I said, Mom, how come you don't never sit down on the bench and talk to the women uh, downstairs? 
are you stuck up? And my mother looked at me, and I looked back at her, and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, no, Johnny, I've never thought I was better than anybody. I've never raised any of my kids to think I'm better than anybody. I said, well, Mama, how come you never sit down and talk to the other mothers downstairs? She said, well, Johnny, you know, I work in the operating room. I can't go in the operating room with a rash or sores on my body, and caterpillars create rashes. Like if a caterpillar fell out of a tree and they're so fragile, if you go to get it off your shoulder, it's going to bust. By the time you take your hand down, you got a sore, or not a sore, but a rash on your body. So I said, you know, Mom, you got, you got a good point. So I said, okay, Mom, I understand. So I must have been about maybe 14, 15 years old, and I went around to the project manager, and I said to the manager, I said, man, we have a problem. He said, what's the problem? I said, the caterpillars. Right away, he told me, get out of my office. <laughs> I told him, I said, man, I have a right to be here. I live here. Get out of my office. I didn't know they had a panic button. That's the first time I've ever seen a panic button. He pushed some little button <laughs> up under the desk. Next thing you know, the project police was there and a guard that they had in the project. And they was putting me out. He said, take him out of my office. So I broke away and I told him, I said, I said, man, you got 48 hours. <laughs> now, how did I come to the thing 48 hours? If I did something wrong and my father thought that I was wrong about it, he gave me 48 hours to give an explanation, I better make it right. So I grew with this. So I told the manager, you got 48 hours. And the cop said, you threatening him? I said, no, it's money back guarantee. If he don't take care of it, I will. So 48 hours came, 48 hours left. Now it was four trees. We had a tunnel coming down in, in the project there. There was two trees on this side and two trees on the other side of the tunnel. So I waited and I waited and I waited. 48 hours come and go and did nothing. So my father had a partner here that owned the gas station right there on 51st and 7th Avenue. So I went down to the gas station, Mr. Gardner. I said, Pop, send me down here to get some gas. He said, where's the gas can? I said, he didn't send one. He said, well, go in the back and get you one. I went back and found the biggest can I can get. Filled it up with gasoline. And I went back to the project and I told the women, I said, listen, y'all should go down to the other end of the project <laughs> or go upstairs. And one of my buddies said, what's the matter? I said, 48 hours ran out. So I, I took the gasoline and I, I, I doused the first tree. And incidentally, let me just say right now, the trees are doing fine. <laughs> they, didn't, they never perished. I dumped the first tree, and, and back at that time, we used to use a lot of stick matches. So I had a pocket full of stick matches, I hit my zipper with the stick match, and I threw it on the tree with my dumb self. I didn't know that that gasoline was going to Singed my nose, singed my, my, my little mustache. You know, it, it's something, you know, when you smell your mustache burning, you can smell like something burning, burning. So then I, I ran to the other tree and I threw the gasoline up before I can get it master fired and jumped from the first tree to the second one. So by that time, the police was coming, but I didn't know they was coming, and I done went over to the third tree. And just as I'm going to the third tree, I'm dousing the tree and hit the tree, and they didn't know whether they should try and attack me or put the fire out. They panicked. When they panicked, then I hit the third tree. I threw the gas and fire jumped. They drug me down, and I had to go to court. You know, my mother, I hear my mother saying, and I didn't tell my mother for 50 years or more about why I did what I did. So I hear my mother tell my father, Earl, I'm not going to the court. That boy didn't embarrass me. Why would he do something like that? I don't understand. I always was on my own clock. So anyway, I get to the court, we wait, judge calls us up. First thing the judge says to my father, he said, Mr. Carlos, does your son have any mental deficiencies? <laughs> so my father said to him, said, no, sir, not that I know of. He said, well, why would he do what he did? And my father said, well, Jan, that's a good question. I'd like to know, too. Why don't you ask him? He's here. The judge said, young man, why did you do what you did? And I said to him, I said, Yana, I said, I talked to my mother one day about why she don't socialize with the parents, and she told me she couldn't do it because of the caterpillars. I said, I felt my responsibility to my mother to go to the manager and ask the manager about why he don't spray the trees. Because as I stated earlier about Highbridge Pool up there, well, when we went through the project up there where the white folks live, they sprayed them trees every summer. Same trees that we had. So I said, I asked him, Yana, and 
The judge said, well, what did he say? He told me to get out of his office. I said, he called the police on me. I said, and I broke away and I told him he had 48 hours to do it. The judge said, you told him what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got 48 hours. He said, well, what happened? I said, 40 hours came and 48 hours left. And it was my time now. So I hit the tree. I said, I protected everybody on him because he asked me, wasn't you concerned about the people? I said, no, I asked him to go down to the other end or go upstairs. <laughs> now, I'm thinking to myself about embarrassment for my family. They had a lot of people from the project in the court. And then the judge said, is the manager of the project here? The manager said, yes, I'm here. The judge said to him, says, uh, how often do you guys pray? And the judge say, no, he asked me, he said, how often did you guys get a stipend? He said, do you get a, I said, yes, we get a stipend. We get a stipend for roaches and rodents and, and caliper. Oh, we get a stipend every year for that. Then he asked me, how often do you spray? He said, we spray every year. So the judge said to him, he said, okay, this is a good time. Take a recess. He said, when you come back, have your records for you spraying. So we go to lunch and my father tell me, son, don't look good. You look like you're gonna be going to jail. <laughs> He, he said reform school, right? So, okay, we go to lunch. He's telling me this. And I'm coming back, and I'm getting more confident now, even more. So when he comes back, he comes with a little thin folder, vanilla folder, one piece of paper in it. So the judge looked at me and said, this is all you got? He said, well, Yana, my secretary is out ill, and I don't know where she keeps the records. But the judge is smart. He was so smart, I didn't know how smart he was until the manager told him that. And he says, anyone from the New York City Housing Authority, when we went to lunch, he got on the phone, he called the New York City Housing Authority and told him to come down with the records. So this guy, when he called them up, the guy came with one of those, looked like an accordion, you know, the brown thing, with, yeah. looked like a spring and tight, rope tied around it and all, and he was just robust. So he said, well, do you have the records? He said, yes, sir, I had the records. They made him take the oath, the whole nine yards. And then he said, well, how often do they uh, get money? He said, well, they get money every year. We send money every year. He said, well, how do you check to see whether they sign? He said, well, Your Honor, the only way we check is by them signing off that they did the job. So he looks at me, uh, my father, and he says, Mr. Collins, do you remember them spraying the trees? My father said, no, nah, you know, I get up and go to work early in the morning, and I come home in the evening, and I don't know whether they spray it or not. He said, Your Honor, but I would think that if they sprayed, I would see a lot of dead caterpillars on the ground. I don't remember seeing them. And I'm hollering, no, they never sprayed. <laughs> so then the man pulled out the paper and he said, how often did they sign off? He said, they signed off all the time. Now my father was in the audience, in, 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 the, in the court, and all the people in the, in the court, a lot of them from the project, and they started co-signing with well, my father. said, they never sprayed. And I remember when I was a little kid, when I first moved in the project, playing a little wading pool. They used to spray. Better than 13 to 15 years, they ain't spray after that. So now the judge called the guy up, and the guy that came down, he had heavy weight. He told the manager to give me the keys so he didn't lost his job for lying and not spraying. I don't know what they did with the money. So now I'm starting to sit up in the chair a little stronger now because I'm feeling good now. <laughs> and here's the kick. And I guess this is something that, that probably carried me on in my life. And I told the class earlier today, you know, it's, it's one thing for a kid to do something and, and your father look at you and tell you, say, son, I have tremendous love for you. That's one thing. We were walking down the court after the judge told my father, said, you should be very, very proud of your son. And, and, and now my father looked at me and he told me something that just floored me then and it's floored me now just to think about it. My father told me, he said, son, I, I love you tremendously. He said, but the love that I have for you is nothing to the respect that I have for you. And I was like 13, 14 years old. And for your daddy to tell you something that you're supposed to be telling him about respect, when my father said that, when I went to Mexico City or anything I've done in my life, and I tell people, there's a lot of people that don't like me, and I can live with the fact that they don't like me. A lot of people love me. But the bottom line is, I don't care which way you go, you're gonna respect me. You know? And I always put that in my kids. Mm. Make sure that you earn the respect and they give it to you.
Mm. God bless you. Yeah. Well, it's a true story. I, I spoke a couple years ago at Miami University in Ohio and working in the admissions department with someone who grew up in the projects with John Carlos. And this was when we were working on the book. And he looked at me and he said, did he tell you about those damn trees? <laughs> um, just thought I'd tell folks that. I, we have time for one more question. I would love it to be for Ms. Tyus because I, it's such a treat that right. you're here. I just, and if you could have that word, that would be amazing. I'll live. Okay, go, go. Yeah. Okay. I can ask. Can Stand up, Mr. Williams. No, they can hear me. It's not just here. Okay. Can hear me? Well, <laughs> what? I guess two more well, stand questions. Stand up so they can hear you, man. Stand up. You ain't gonna take the mic, stand I'm, up. I'm gonna ask him a question. I wanna ask Kevin. No, he wants you to ask Ty a question. Well, I'm gonna ask Ty a question too. Well, ask him right first. Okay, well, uh, but I wanna answer through, through, through. through Come on, Kevin. Williams. Okay, <laughs> no, no, what I would like to know, but I'd like, can anybody hear me? We'll get, we'll get you last, sir, up there, okay? What I would Just like to know hold your horses, Dave, yeah. Uh, what is taking so, and I don't want nobody to get angry at me because I'm down below here. Uh, what's, why is Wyoming Tyus? and John Carlos being white ball from the big screen. After 50 years, they've had TVs and everybody on, on, on the big screen. It seems like that they've had documentaries and all of this, but to, for some reason, they've been let out of, of- Are you talking about Hollywood? Of Hollywood. Okay, actual, okay. That, and, and are you gonna try to assist or do anything about that to help them? Yeah, I mean, I'm not Steven Spielberg or anything, but like, <laughs> but- But if you're Steven Spielberg, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'll just say very briefly that it's, uh, if there's one thing we've seen recently, it's that movies like uh, Concussion and 42 and this latest movie Race about uh, Jesse Owens, it shows that there is a thirst and a desire for stories about uh, black history and sports and the intersection of those two things. And to me, that there are no, there is no greater story about the intersection uh, between uh, black history, black resistance in sports than what took place at the 1968 Olympics. And that's the story of Wyoming Atias, that's the story of John Carlos, that's the story of Tommy Smith, that's the story of Lee Evans, and that's a story that needs to be told. And I'm going to move, I'm going to move, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a snail pushing a grain of sand on the question of getting a movie made, but I'll push that grain of sand uh, as far as I can because it, it absolutely has to happen. Thank you. Thank All right. You. singing the songs, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, like uh, I was did a show with Dave one day uh, at MSNBC, and we were, we were getting done with our show, and, and one of the state senators was going in, remember that? Yeah. And, and he looks at me and he says, uh, he says, John, what are, you, what are you doing now? And I said, running for justice, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I'm on, I'm on the hunt every day. And incidentally, baby girl, uh, Talking about you from Trinidad, my first major trip outside the United States was to Trinidad. Uh, that was an enlightenment for me, uh, based on the fact that I had gone to a country that was run by black people, that was controlled by black people. And I used to like to drink a lot of wine. I got turned on to drinking rum when I went there too. <laughs> so, but but I, I fell in love with Trinidad so much until I actually wanted to move to Trinidad until the drug trade got real bad over there. But I will always have Trinidad and Port of Spain and Texaco Village and all that in my heart because Trinidad was the catalyst to really keep me going, to let me know that there is hope. 
Wow. And Ms. Haas, do you want to try to answer that as well? I didn't hear the, what you said. The oh, about, repeat your statement. About, about uh, organizing today and keeping the flame lit and how you feel about doing that. Well, as I said, stated a long time before that that's something you have to do. It never leaves you. If you've been in the fight, you stay in the fight. You, that's, the, that's the key to winning the fight, that you have to be there. You have to always make your statements. You have to always be able to say, these are the things that are happening. These are things that are not happening. I know I don't speak on it a lot, especially about myself. It's very difficult to talk about yourself and things that have happened to you and how you feel about it. But uh, all the things that Carlos have said tonight about what he sees or have seen and what's not happening or what's not been given to me. I don't feel nothing should be given. I feel I've worked for it. I feel mm -hmm. I earned it. And I feel it, right. when it comes, right. it will come, hopefully in my lifetime when I can appreciate mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and uh, I just want to also say, you know, I thank everybody for coming tonight and that for me to be able to share a little part of me and a, a lot of the Tiger Bells, I can really appreciate it and let you can go home and know that you can go on the internet and look it up and uh, this doesn't have to end here. It can always continue to go because I'm always available to talk about it. Mm. Oh. And, uh, uh, hey, listen, let me just, let me just say this. Uh, Wami Tiles is getting ready to get started on writing a book. <laughs> okay. So put, 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 that, put that in your cap. I have a book. <laughs> the John Carlos story, my writer, David Zarin. Excellent book. More so, I have a page on the internet, johncarlos68.com. Not John Carlos 1968, but John Carlos 68.com. I would hope that you guys would register in that page. Don't cost you a dime. There's a lot of knowledge in there. We educate uh, a lot about history. And most of all, push your kids. If you got kids, push them that way and ask them to join up. Just sign up and become a part of the page. God bless you. And thank you, as Ty said, for sharing your time with us tonight. And absolutely. Um, and, and one last um, answer to your question, because I'm, I'm only answering it because I'm thinking of something that John Carlos once said. Our book came out uh, in the fall of uh, 2011, right when the Occupy encampments were popping up all over the country. And the first event we did after the book came out was at Occupy New York. We addressed the entire Occupy contingent. And yeah, Occupy Wall Street. We were down there. Um, in uh, Zuccotti Park, and I'll never forget what, what John said to, to the folks there. He said, he said, you have to stand up and organize where you are. For me, that just happened to be the 1960, at, at Mexico City in 1968. That's where I was, so that's where I stood up. You're here, down here at Zuccotti Park on Wall Street, so that's where you need to stand up. And I think about Oakland and the Bay, and it's like, what does it mean to take the legacy of Wyoming Atias and John Carlos here? That means for standing for justice for Mario Woods. That means standing for justice for the homeless who are displaced in the Bay Area. And that definitely means uh, right here on this campus of standing with your professors in their push for economic justice. And, um, And, and, and not everybody is gonna be able to win consecutive 100 meter gold medals and not everybody is gonna run 100 yards in 8.8 .8 seconds, but anybody could stand by the principles by which these two people have led their lives. So thank you very much. And if we could give them a round of applause. And